Kaya Kunamin. Hello and welcome. My name's Frida Ogilvie, for those of you who don't know me. I'm a retired principal and teacher, and I grew up in White Gum Valley. And I went to John Curtin Senior High School. The only school in the state that's worth talking about, still today. And, um, and I think there were four of us Collard kids who went there, and then South Fremantle Senior High School was built, which is now known as Fremantle College. So that's the way history goes, and um, some things are still there today, some things are not there today. But um, I'm purple and I'm passionate. But I'm also blue and white, the Waffle Premiers this year, but my closer team is red and white and they didn't have a very good season. So, um, but anyway, that's um, my footy season for this year. Sometimes I cry more than I smile with that purple team, but I'll continue on. But I want to say kaya, kaya, kunamin. Hello, hello and welcome. Ngan pura, nija burda kuap wanji maman, buju nija. I pay my respects to my elders past, present, and future leaders and strangers on watch up land. Aboriginal spirituality is defined as at the core of Aboriginal being, their very identity. It gives meaning to all aspects of life, including relationships with one another and the environment. All objects are living and share the same soul and spirit as Aboriginals. There is a kinship with the environment. Aboriginality spirituality can be expressed visually, musically and ceremonially. Those are the words of my grandfather, although he never went to school, so his grandchildren had to translate into that academic language. And you probably know Professor Dr Len Collard now, so he's got a couple of those titles in front of me. Sis, go and do yours. No, 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 I'm right. <laughs> So across every generation, our elders have played and continue to play an important role and hold a prominent place in our communities and families. They are cultural knowledge holders, trailblazers, nurturers, advocates, teachers, survivors, leaders, hard workers and innovators. And I've been working with the um, Future of Fremantle group with DPLH and um, I said to them, we need to have a Noongar SciTech. A what? Yes, a Noongar SciTech. Because our people are innovators in so many things. For Aboriginal people, we were here before those Italian era dynamic people decided to go and try their hand at their aeroplanes and things. We had the boomerang going up, going down and coming back. And I said, we need to let the rest of the community and the whole world know about our innovation in Noongar community. But it doesn't have to be just Noongar. We could go Australia-wide because there are so many people who've come up with so many things. And I suppose my claim to fame is the Best Start program, which was a zero to fours um, program across uh, from about uh, Carnarvon down, and it was used in remote schools. And I said, after going to university, I realised this is a different language. I can't go home and talk about pedagogy or andragogy. My mob will think I'm swearing at them. <laughs> so I've got to explain it and translate it for them. And, um, and so that program was around for about um, 20 years. Might have been a bit more, but it was more to focus on the language and how the parents could work with their children to get them ready for year one. So as a Balladoc Awajak custodian and traditional owner and a matriarch, I welcome you to the Great Sea and the Great Rivers, the Derbal Yerrigan and the Jalgarra, or the Canning River, which means abundance, where my family and ancestors left their footprints while gathering their food and constructing their myamais for over 60,000 years. Everything in our vast landscape has meaning and purpose. We speak our own language and have our own law and customs. The law is characterised by a strong spiritual connection to country. This means caring for the natural environment and for places of significance. And one of those places is the Darling Ranges. How did it come around? The old Wagle decided that he had enough down here on the 
plains and the flat, he'd go over the hill. And as he went over the hill, he dropped his scales. So when you look at the Darling Ranges, you can see that there is a purple-blue hue. And you can see, through another set of lens, the scales that he left behind. So our law is pr practised from a cultural governance system, following an unspoken yet understood law. I know. And Grandma knows everything. Because her grandchildren tried to tell her, no, we don't go, go to school today, Nan. I said, excuse me, I know you do have to go to school. Ah, oh, so you better get ready and run along. <laughs> so they've tried that a few times. So the hill country is inherent to our identity. It sustains our lives in every aspect, spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially and culturally. It's more than a place. When we talk about country, it's spoken of like a person. Country is family, kin, law, law, ceremony, traditions and language. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, it's been this way since the dawn of time. Through our languages and songs, we speak to the country. Through our ceremonies and traditions, we sing to and celebrate country, and the country speaks to us. <coughs> Increasingly, we worry about country. For generations, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have been calling for stronger measures to recognise, protect and maintain all aspects of our culture and heritage for all Australians. And one of those um, strategies that's coming to fruition is the Metronet. Now we have actually renamed all the stations, or most of the stations, with their Noongar name, which is their proper name, their right name. And it's quite interesting because I put it on Facebook and there are lots of comments, yes, yeah, about time. But this has all come about because um, through the work of my eldest brother Neville and through Len, and they've been doing place names with a um, couple of the local governments and it's continuing down there with the city of Melville um, today. So we're still waiting for these robust protect protections. Healing country means hearing those those pleas to provide greater management, involvement and empowerment by Indigenous people over country. Healing country means embracing First Nations cultural knowledge and understanding of, of country as part of Australia's natural heritage. So among our people, we come to know our connection to country through our murat or our families. This means we can identify our country, the place where we feel at home. Noongar law and custom guides the ways in which, in which we define our country and our rights to it. Law influences how we connect with and care for the land. As Noongar people, we have a duty to speak for our country, to acknowledge its value to our communities and to observe law that governs who may or may not speak for country, as well as share with the broader community. Some, some of you have come from a great distance. Some of you are going on a great journey. Go safely as you return home. And I invite you to walk beside me and share the history, language and the culture of the Noongar people. This contribution makes a rich tapestry to move forward in reconciliation and truth. And my favourite author, when I was growing up, and I always had my nose in a book reading something, and my mother used to get wild with me, if you don't do, go and sweep that floor or mop the floor or do those dishes, I only get that stick on you, Frida. Yeah, Mum, I'll be there in a minute. About half an hour later, Frida, have you done those dishes? No, I'm just coming now, Mum. I'd wait till I heard her footsteps coming up the passage and I'd jump and run. <laughs> so my favourite author was Eleanor Roosevelt. And I actually translated into Noongar. Nija Kejela Kuring Murich Karijan. And I think it's also one of the fantastic messages for us to go forward. With the new day comes new strength and new thoughts. So I'm going to teach you a new word now. Yanka. Can you say Yanka? Yanka. Thank you. Thank you. And the other one is Burdawan. Burdawan, because we don't have goodbye in our language. We just say, see you later. So thank you. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, uh, Auntie Frieda, for that wonderful welcome.
I found your words very valuable and moving, and I think it's especially instructive for us to reflect on them as we try to move beyond the recent referendum uh, toward deeper mutual understanding and partnership. I also wish to acknowledge that we're gathered here tonight on the lands of the Wajuk Noongar people, and I pay my respects to all elders past and present. I recognize their deep knowledge and their cultural, spiritual and educational practices and aspire to learn and teach in partnership with them. Good evening, everyone, and Kaya. Welcome to the 2023 John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Anniversary Lecture. For those who don't know me, my name is David Wells, and I'm one of the deputy directors of the University Library. I'm standing in for our university librarian, Kylie Percival, who is very disappointed that she's unfortunately unable to be here tonight. Uh, firstly, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you haven't done so already, uh, can I please ask you to switch your mobile phone to silent? In the unlikely event of an emergency where we're required to evacuate, please exit via the front door here or the doors at the back of the venue. The nearest muster point is in the PI1 car park at the end of Rob Riley Walk, which is just that way. Please follow the instructions of event staff who will guide you. The John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library, I shall say JCPML from now on, the JCPML Anniversary Lecture commemorates the anniversary of John Curtin's death on the 5th of July 1945. Curtin was the only Australian Prime Minister to represent a Western Australian seat in the House of Representatives and led his country during the most critical phase of World War II. The JCPML recognises and celebrates Curtin's significant contribution to Australian society. I please now ask that you join me in welcoming Curtin's Vice-Chancellor, Professor Harleen Hain, CNZM, to formally welcome you to this special event and to introduce this year's speaker, Emeritus Professor Tom Griffiths, AO. Thank you very much, David. Um, Kaya, everyone. It is with deep respect that I also recognize that we are meeting on the traditional lands of the Wajak people this evening, and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. I recognize that I am incredibly privileged to share the land with the oldest continuing culture in the world. Um, people have lived and learned and laughed and loved on these lands for tens of thousands of years. As you can tell by my accent, I'm still a relative newcomer to this country. Um, and I know that I am still learning about Aboriginal ways of being and knowing. But I think right now, in this time in history, it's important for all of us, not only newcomers to this country, um, to work toward a greater and deeper understanding and appreciation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures. I know that I am personally incredibly grateful for the support that I receive from my Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander colleagues and I admire their enduring strength as they continue to fight for justice and fairness in their own land. Now, before we begin um, this evening, I would like to acknowledge some of our very special guests who have joined us. Um, former Labour leader and patron of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library, the Honorable Kim Beasley AC. Kim, it's fantastic to have you here. Um, it's an honor always to have you in our audience, and we really share our gratitude with the, the comments that you will set, share with us um, later on this evening. Um, we really appreciate your ongoing support of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library, and it's fantastic to have you at this anniversary lecture. Um, I'd also like to acknowledge our federal member for SWAN, um, Zanita Mascarenas, MP. Zanita, as always, it's also wonderful to have you here with us. Um, and we look forward to sharing some fellowship with you at the end of the lecture. 
And last but certainly not least, I'd like to warmly welcome members of John Curtin's family who are here with us this evening. It always makes this event incredibly special um, to have people who actually knew John Curtin um, with us um, to share some of your memories. And I had the great fortune, as did Tom and others, uh, to share some afternoon tea with you. So as always, it is wonderful to have you here. So for everyone who has joined us this evening, um, it is a great pleasure to welcome all of you to the 2023 John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Anniversary Lecture. Um, it's an honor to stand before you as we mark the 25th anniversary of this esteemed event, celebrating and reflecting on the legacy of Australia's 14th Prime Minister, the Honourable John Curtin. John Curtin's legacy is absolutely undeniable. I'm sure that it's clear to all of you who have taken time out of your busy schedule to gather here this evening that you recognize that this lecture was created in his name. It is supported by his dedicated prime ministerial library and it is hosted by his namesake university. His imprint on all of us extends far beyond the bounds of our Bentley campus. John Curtin's name has been bestowed upon a Fremantle College of Arts a Canberra School of Medical Research, a Royal Australian Air Force Base, the former headquarters of the Australian Labour Party, even a cattle station in the Northern Territory and a beloved pub and music venue in Carlton, Victoria, all bear John Curtin's name. But of course, his impact is far greater than sharing his name with buildings. Prime Minister Curtin's commitment to freedom and liberty elevated Australia's place on the world stage and cut a path for his successors to stand tall alongside other great world leaders. His work helped our nation to be held in high esteem as we work in partnership with international industry, government and communities. As Curtin himself described Australians in his famed address to the United States in 1942, be assured of the caliber of our national caliber. We are too strong in our hearts. Our spirit is too high. The justice in our cause throbs too deeply in our being for that high purpose to be overcome. This lecture too has proven that John Curtin's memory transcends political barriers bringing Australian politician, premiers, and prime ministers, including Gough Whitlam, Natasha Stott, Stott Despoja, Kim Beasley, Paul Keating, Malcolm Fraser, Jeff Gallup, and Julia Gillard to speak on his greatness and his ongoing impact in for, um, prior lectures. Speaking of the breadth of John Curtin's legacy, this year's presenter of the anniversary lecture is particularly well placed to address the vast and sprawling influence that John Curtin has had on our nation. Emeritus Professor Tom Griffiths AO was formerly W.K. Hancock Professor of History in the Research School of Social Sciences at the Australian National University. And he was the foundation director of the Center for Environmental History. He is chair of the editorial board of the Australian Dictionary of Biography and a multi-award winning author whose history expertise spans social, cultural, environmental, public and global realms, not to mention Antarctica. It's fair to say that Professor Griffiths is well equipped to speak on Curtin's lasting effect on this nation and on the world around us. So without further ado, Please join me in welcoming Emeritus Professor Tom Griffiths to present the 2023 John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Anniversary Lecture titled The World After John Curtin, Geopolitics and the Planet. Please join me in welcoming Tom. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you, Auntie Frida Ogilvy, uh, for your welcome to country. I respect and thank you and um, all the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation uh, 
for your long and continuing care for this country over millennia. Thank you. Health Vice-Chancellor, uh, Professor Hain, thank you for your words uh, and for inviting me to give this lecture tonight. Um, as you know, for a quarter of a century now, uh, Curtin University, through its Prime Ministerial Library, has invited speakers to revisit the life and legacy of John Curtin and to draw on his wisdom in considering the challenges facing Australia today. And I think that's exactly what a university should be doing, carefully curating these precious intellectual traditions and legacies. So thank you to all at this university and to the Vice-Chancellor for that work. The Honourable Kim Beasley, it is wonderful to have you in the audience, Kim, thank you. And I pay tribute to you and your father for your grace and leadership in the long and continuing uh, campaign for Indigenous justice in this country. Thank you. And to the children, our grandchildren and family of John Curtin, what a pleasure to meet you this afternoon. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honour to address you. I began today by walking to the statue of the member for Fremantle in, at the heart of Fremantle. And there he is, caught forever, brandishing a newspaper and speaking to his fellow citizens. To the staff of the University Library and of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library, especially David Wells and Sally Lemming and Nathan Hobby, thank you for your wonderful introduction to the archive yesterday. That was lovely to see the work that you're doing there, the precious treasure that you have there and look after so well. Ladies and gentlemen, the statement for which John Curtin is most round, and this slide comes from the new galleries of the Western Australian Museum. Uh, that statement came early in his prime ministership, as you know, at the end of 1941. It's recalled now almost as a sacred text, isn't it? As news from Malaya worsened and the Japanese forces swiftly advanced south, Curtin readied Australians for war in their own hemisphere. The war against Japan, he explained, was a new war. The Pacific struggle was distinct. This war in Australia's own region, he implied, was equal in gravity to the war in Germany, war against Germany. In late December, Curtin made his famous statement, and I will quote it because it is meet and right so to do. The Prime Minister said, without any inhibitions of any kind, I make it quite clear that Australia looks to America, free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with Britain. Now, with those carefully chosen words, inhibitions, pangs and kinship, Curtin acknowledged that this geopolitical pivot carried an emotional cost for Australians. The population was still overwhelmingly of British descent and home was Britain, even for many of those born here. Curtin's words therefore implied a national coming of age, a relinquishment of childhood dependence, a step into maturity. A British dominion was asserting an independent foreign policy. Australia, facing peril, was insisting on a direct, unmediated relationship with the United States of America. And when we think of Curtin, it is so often this declaration that comes to mind, for it represents a cool Australian assessment of geopolitical realities at a moment of existential threat for the nation. My predecessors as lecturers in this series have often revisited this declaration too. They've analysed the geopolitical world of Curtin and its transformation through the decades that followed. Superpower rivalry and the Cold War, the reconstruction of post-war society, 
the strengthening American alliance, the rise of China, empire and decolonization, the reckoning with a settler's colonial past, Australia's defence and security in a globalised world. And these are all extrapolations of the world Curtin knew. He either played a part in bringing them about or might reasonably have foreseen them. His words echo down the years with enduring meaning. But there is a dimension of the future that he could not possibly see or even imagine. Indeed, it has blindsided us all. That is my subject tonight. When John Curtin died in office in 1945, his legendary status was confirmed and his words gained even more weight. The year of his death became another turning point, the loss of a revered prime minister, the end of the Second World War, a new era of social reconstruction in which Curtin had invested, the beginning of a long economic boom such as Australia had not known since the 1880s, and the unleashing of the atomic bomb. Eleven days after Curtin's death, the atomic era was born. On the 16th of July, the world's first nuclear device was exploded at the Trinity's test site in New Mexico. Stratigraphers identify geological eras by residues in rocks, and 1945 is marked in sediment by the abrupt global geological signature of nuclear fallout. Curtin was acutely conscious of Australia's place in the world. World-mindedness was a common phrase in the 1940s, expressing an aspiration for peace and understanding after decades of war. Curtin also thought globally, for he was a citizen of an empire that spanned the earth, a pacifist and a politician keenly aware of the international labour movement. He was conscious that a southern land at the bottom of the globe could not isolate itself from an increasingly connected world. He revived and extended immigration and joined international negotiations leading to global institutions like the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank. His colleague, Dr Evert, would later serve as president of the United Nations General Assembly. So there was world-mindedness and there were global, social and political perspectives. But did Curtin ever think in terms of the planet, a living, breathing, vulnerable Earth? Probably not. This requires environmental thinking in deep time and deep space, a consciousness that has evolved in our own lifetimes. It's a perspective and an understanding that Curtin and his contemporary leaders could not have foreseen or even imagined. John Edwards writes beautifully in the first volume of his book, John Curtin's War, of Curtin's sense of time and space. Edwards reconstructs Curtin's regular commute across the Nullarbor. His crossing of the vast treeless plain by train from Perth to Canberra, a journey that took him five nights and four days on six different trains with five changes of gauge. He describes Curtin and his fellow passengers smelling the faint, dry fragrance of salt bush and mallee scrub as it had been for millions of years. When stretching their legs during the stops, they walked the bed of an ancient sea and crunched fossils of sea creatures underfoot. Edwards reminds us that in its entire length, the Trans-Australian track did not cross a single permanent stream of water. What a path to the parliament. <laughs> there were 500 kilometres of precisely straight track surrounded by desert where Curtin could see the circle of the plain around him from horizon to horizon. And at night through the right hand windows, he could pick out the points of the Southern Cross. He preferred not to fly. And anyway, the air services were neither frequent nor comfortable. But later, during wartime, when he was forced to fly the Atlantic, Curtin told his secretary that he placed his hopes of making the crossing in the skill of the pilot 
the rotation of the earth and God Almighty. That is human ingenuity, the steady old reliable planet and God. It's that, that view of the steady old reliable planet, the unchanging earth that has been disrupted in our lifetimes. How has our understanding of the world, the planet, changed since John Curtin's death? In the first decades of the 21st century, we are living in uncanny times, for they are weird, strange and unsettling in ways that question nature and culture, and even the possibility of distinguishing between them. The modern history of the Western world, the Renaissance, the expansion of European peoples across the globe, the scientific revolution of the 17th and 18th centuries, the dawning of the Enlightenment, the Industrial Revolution, these are chiefly stories of the separation of culture from nature. Indeed, they are stories of the mastery of culture over nature. Now, in our own time, we find nature and culture collapsing into one another all around us. No wonder, no wonder it feels uncanny. The Bengali writer Amitav Ghosh uses the term uncanny in his book, The Great Derangement, Climate Change and the Unthinkable. For him, the word uncanny captures our experience of what he calls the urgent proximity of non-human presences. He's referring to other creatures, insects, animals, plants, biota, the very elements themselves, water, earth, fire, water, and our renewed and long forgotten sense of dependence upon them. The planet is alive, says Gosh. And only for the last three centuries have we forgotten that. We've been suffering from the great derangement, a disturbing condition of willful and systematic blindness to the consequences of our own actions. When we are knowingly killing the planetary systems that support the survival of our species. That's what's uncanny about our times, that we are half aware of this predicament, yet also paralysed by it, caught between horror and hubris. So we inhabit a critical moment in the history of the Earth and of life on this planet, and a most unusual one we should recognise in terms of our own human history. To understand the implications of the present, we have to think in deep time. It's very hard for us humans to comprehend or even imagine deep time. If you think of Earth's history as the old measure of the English yard, that is the distance from the king's nose to the tip of his outstretched hand, then one stroke of a nail file on his middle finger erases all of human history. And the discussion of deep times, full of these sorts of metaphors, human history is the last inch of the cosmic mile, the last few seconds before midnight, the skin of paint atop the Eiffel Tower. Metaphor is possibly the only way, the only level on which we can comprehend such immensities of time. If we stretch the timeline across this lecture theatre, from, from that wall across to here, and um, then from, and it represented the history of the universe from the Big Bang right up to the present, then all of human history from the time of our evolution as a species would be represented by the film of dust on that wall. Now I'm delighted to find that the new galleries at the Western Australian Museum, Boulevardic, I think do a wonderful job of conjuring deep time in the telling of natural and human histories. In the last couple of decades, we've developed three powerful historical metaphors for making sense of the ecological crisis we inhabit. One is that we live in the sixth extinction. Humans have wiped out about two thirds of the world's wildlife in just the last half century. Let that sentence sink in. It has happened in less than a human lifetime. This is an extinction rate a hundred to a thousand times higher than was normal in nature. There have been 
other such catastrophic collapses in the diversity of life on Earth, five of them, sudden shocking falls in the graph of biodiversity separated by tens of millions of years. The last one in the immediate aftermath of the asteroid impact that ended the age of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. We now have to ask ourselves, are we inhabiting, are we causing the sixth extinction? In 2014, the American journalist Elizabeth Colbert wrote an influential book called The Sixth Extinction, and she subtitled it An Unnatural History. It's unnatural because the sixth extinction involves, to some, some extent, our consciousness and intent. Another metaphor for the extraordinary character of our times is the idea of the Anthropocene. This is an insight that we've entered a new geological era, epoch, in the history of the Earth, and we've now left behind the 12,000 years of the relatively stable epoch known as the Holocene the period since the last great ice age. The new epoch of the Anthropocene recognises the power of humans in changing the nature of the planet, its atmosphere, oceans, climate, biodiversity, even its rocks and stratigraphy. It places humans on a par with other geophysical forces, such as variations in the Earth's orbit, glaciers, volcanoes, and asteroid strikes. Now, there's debate about exactly when the Anthropocene began, but one definition is that we were first jolted into the new epoch by the Industrial Revolution in the late 18th century when we began digging up and burning fossil fuels, that brilliant and profligate exploitation of a finite, buried resource underpinned population growth and economic expansion. And as we know, it also unleashed carbon on a massive and accelerating scale, and it began changing the atmosphere of the planet. Another date for the beginning of the Anthropocene is around 1945, the year of Curtin's death. It was, as we've seen, the beginning of the atomic era. It also initiated an exponential shift in the impact of humans on the planet. In the mid-20th century, the human enterprise exploded dramatically in population and energy use and rapidly began to outstrip its planetary support systems. Look at the repetitive pattern in those graphs. Don't worry about the detail, just look at that pattern. World population, water use, tropical forest loss, and so on, all soaring after 1950. And this turning point is known as the Great Acceleration. So I've talked about the sixth extinction and the Anthropocene. And there is a third potent metaphor for the moment we inhabit. It concerns the history and future of fire. It suggests that we are entering not just the Anthropocene, but also a fire age, which we call the Pyrocene. The planet is heating due to human greenhouse gas emissions, and it's heating so quickly that it threatens to tip Earth into an escalating cycle of fire. In other words, we are entering an extended fire age that is comparable to past ice ages. Now let's just take a moment to think about those ice ages. 2.6 million years ago, the Earth entered a period of rhythmical ice ages, a geolo geological epoch called the Pleistocene. And during this epoch, average global temperatures dropped 6 to 10 degrees Celsius and ice sheets at the poles extended dramatically across Eurasia and North America. These Repetitive glaciations were harsh, and they demanded innovation and versatility. They were a selective pressure on evolution, and they promoted the emergence of humanity on Earth. Throughout the Pleistocene, the Ice Ages were punctuated by brief warmer periods known as interglacials, which generate, generally lasted about 10,000 years. And we are living in an interglacial right now. Geologists have separated it off from the Pleistocene and called it the Holocene, which means recent. But it is really part of the same rhythmic pattern that has prevailed since we, as a species, evolved. We humans, then, are creatures of the ice. The Pyrocene, the Fire Age, is something we've never seen before. 
The Pyrocene threatens to knock Earth out of the steady planetary rhythm that has seen, that has seen the birth of our own species. Now, how do we know about these ancient rhythmic ice ages? By reading the rocks, of course, but also now by studying the ice itself. I'm fortunate to have visited both of Earth's ice caps. And the most awesome one is definitely ours. <laughs> the southern one, Antarctica. I twice voyaged south with the Australian Antarctic Division. On the second occasion, at the invitation of the Australian government to mark the centenary of Douglas Mawson's Australasian Antarctic Expedition of 1911 to 14. There's the hundred that we carved in the ice, and there are the Adelie penguins who very kindly stood guard by it. <laughs> and after a long wait for a break in the weather, we held a ceremony on the ice at the historic huts, the place that Mawson called the home of the blizzard. Through the years of Curtin's political life, Antarctica was becoming a primary site for Australian world-mindedness. And in 1959, our nation proudly was one of the original 12 signatories to the Antarctic Treaty, which was effectively the first disarmament treaty of the nuclear age. Now, Antarctica is where nine-tenths of the world's land ice resides. 70% of the Earth's fresh water is locked up in that ice cap. That's a discovery humans made in my lifetime. Antarctica is not only the coldest and windiest continent, it is also paradoxically the driest, and it is the highest. It has the highest average height of any continent because it is a great dome of ice, four or five kilometres thick, that has built up over millions of years. In the 1950s, we discovered that the driest of all continents is actually a vast elevated plateau of frozen water. The implications of that discovery are immense. It means that world sea levels are principally controlled by the state of the Antarctic ice sheet. If the southern ice cap melted, oceans would rise by more than 60 metres. As we enter the Pyrocene, Antarctica, we now know, is vulnerable and it's fragile. It's more brittle than we expected. This year, the expanse of winter sea ice around Antarctica diminished dramatically below its average by the size of Western Australia. The continent of ice is a precious glistening jewel that holds the key to our future and to our past. It's, it's a giant white fossil, a luminous relic, a clue to lost ages. It enables us to travel through time to the Pleistocene Earth. The ice is an amazing archive. Embedded in an ice cap are tiny air bubbles from hundreds of thousands of years ago. When you drill into an ice cap kilometres thick, you can extract a core that is layered year by year, a precious archive of deep time. I think of ice cores as the holy scripts, the sacred scrolls of our age. The deepest Antarctic cores currently retrieve 800,000 years of climate history. And right now, you may know that the search is on. It's on for the first million year ice core, and Australia is involved, brilliantly, I think, in the quest. In the 1990s, a long 400,000 year Antarctic ice core was extracted from the inland ice sheet. Here is what was distilled from it. Again, don't look at the detail, just look at the pattern. Carbon dioxide on the top, temperature below across 400,000 years, a rhythmic sawtooth graph of past ice ages. This, this is the heartbeat of the planet. The brief peaks are warmer interglacials. The extended troughs are the cold ice ages. The ice core charted four full cycles of glacial and interglacial periods and established that the carbon dioxide and methane concentrations in the atmosphere moved in lockstep with the ice sheets and the temperature. This is the barometer of the planet's health. 
a graph of its nervous system, if you like, through hundreds of thousands of years. Ice cores also revealed that present-day levels of greenhouse gases are unprecedented during the past 800,000 years and longer. The level of carbon dioxide in the historic air bubbles has leapt since the Industrial Revolution and especially since 1950. So before Antarctica was even seen by humans, it was recording our impact. And it was this, it was this glimpse of the deep past, as revealed in the archive of ice, that shocked people into a real sense of urgency about the climate crisis. Now, these three metaphors that I've been talking about, the sixth extinction, the Anthropocene, and the Pyrocene, they're historical concepts, aren't they, that require us to travel in geological and biological time across hundreds of millions of years and then to arrive back at the present with a sense not of continuity, but of discontinuity, of profound rupture in our own time. That's what Earth system science has revealed. It's now too late to go back to the Holocene. It may even be too late to hang on to the Pleistocene, the long epoch that birthed our species. We've irrevocably changed the Earth system and unwittingly steered the planet into an uncertain future. Now we can't take our hand off the tiller. We have to use our awesome power wisely. The metaphors of deep time that we've been considering have some visual counterparts in deep space that also emerged in the last half century. In 1968, the historic Apollo 8 mission launched humans beyond Earth's orbit for the first time, out across the void and into the gravitational power of another heavenly body. For three lunar orbits, the three astronauts studied the strange, desolate, cratered surface below them. And then, as they came out from the dark side of the moon for the fourth time, they looked up and gasped. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. Here's the Earth coming up. Wow, that is pretty, said Frank Borman. And Bill Anders said, hey, don't take that. It's not scheduled. <laughs> they did take the unscheduled photo excitedly, and it became famous, as you know. Perhaps, perhaps the most famous photograph of the 20th century. The blue planet floating alone, finite and vulnerable in space above a dead lunar landscape. Frank Borman said, it was the most beautiful, heart-catching sight of my life. And Bill Anders declared, we came all this way to explore the moon. And the most important thing is that we discovered the Earth. A few years later, in 1972, a photo taken by the Apollo 17 mission and known as the Blue Marble, became one of the most reproduced pictures in the world, showing the Earth here as a luminous breathing garden in the dark void. Those two photos, Earth Rise and the Blue Marble, had a profound impact on environmental politics and sensibilities. Within a few years, the American scientists Lynn Margulis and James Lovelock put forward the Gaia hypothesis that the Earth is a single self-regulating organism. In the year of the Apollo 8 mission, Paul Ehrlich published his book, The Population Bomb, an urgent appraisal of a finite Earth. During the years of the moon missions, British economist Barbara Ward wrote Spaceship Earth and Only One Earth, revealing how economics had failed to account for environmental damage and degradation, and arguing that exponential growth could not continue forever. Earth Day was established in 1970, a day to honour the planet as a whole, a total environment needing protection. In 1972, the Club of Rome released its controversial and enormously influential report, The Limits to Growth, which sold over 13 million copies and went into over 30 translations. And in their report, Donella Meadows and Dennis Meadows wrestled, wrestled with the contradiction of trying to force infinite material growth on a finite planet. The cover of their book, as you can see here, depicted a whole Earth, a shrinking 
Two decades later, on Valentine's Day 1990, the Voyager spacecraft was tracking beyond Saturn, six billion kilometres away, when it unexpectedly glanced over its shoulder. Again, Voyager wasn't programmed to look behind as it journeyed into the unknown. But scientists decided to take a risk and commanded the spacecraft to look back. And so we have a picture of Earth as a mere speck of dust in space, an image that astronomer Carl Sagan called the pale blue dot. Look again at that dot, wrote Sagan. That's here. That's home. That's us. These images from outer space of the unity, finiteness, finiteness and loneliness of the Earth helped escalate planetary thinking. From a colossal integration of Earth systems data came a keen understanding of planetary boundaries, thresholds in planetary ecology, and the extent to which the human enterprise is threatening or exceeding them. Three identified thresholds have already been crossed, changes in climate, biodiversity and the nitrogen cycle. At least we now understand our predicament, even if we are perilously slow to act. The fossil fuels that got humans to the moon now endanger our civilization. Now let's bring this story back home to our place on this earth. Australia is uniquely exposed to the grim rough edges of these new world narratives. Shockingly, we are leading the world into the sixth extinction. Modern Australian history is like a giant experiment in ecological crisis and management. Ecologists in, working in Australia today often feel like they're ambulance drivers arriving at the scene of an accident. The southwest of Western Australia, for example, is one of the world's biodiversity hotspots. What an extraordinary place this is. What an extraordinary region you live in. Uh, it's also experiencing an exceptional loss of habitat. It is the site of what has been called a radical disappearance, an extinction event on a grand scale. And we inhabit the continent of fire, the driest inhabited inhabited continent, a land of drought and flooding rains that is held in the grip of the El Nino Southern Oscillation, which means that Australia is on the front line of the piracy, as we know. Southwest Western Australia, with its sudden 30 per cent decline in rainfall since the 1970s, is one of the first places to experience the climatic shift expected with global warming. And the black summer fires, when around a million hectares of the Great Western Woodlands burnt, they were a symptom of our condition and became a planetary event. Smoke from those fires encircled the globe. Furthermore, our modern history is a byproduct of the Anthropocene. The British invasion of Australia was part of the age of empire and took place as the Industrial Revolution gathered momentum in England. Thus, Australia's transformation into a colony coincided with the start of the fossil fuel era. The Endeavour, it was a repurposed coal ship. The new nation became highly dependent on fossil fuels, especially on coal. And in recent decades, it drew world attention by persisting with the political denial of climate change. Modern Australia, we have to remember, was built on denial the denial of Aboriginal sovereignty and cultural sophistication, the denial of frontier violence and warfare. And earlier this month, we witnessed a further national expression of denial. But we have many opportunities here too. Our robust democracy, our active citizenship, our capacity for creativity and innovation, our impressive community leaders, many of them young, many of them women, our unique and inspiring environment, our destiny as a re renewable energy superpower, and the continent's deep indigenous human history. In just a generation, we have turned upside down the way we understand the history of Australia. 
When I was in primary school, the history of this country was told as a footnote to the story of the British Empire. And in my classroom, the book we used was this one, A Short History of Australia, written in 1916, the year after the Gallipoli landing, by Professor Ernest Scott, and it began with what he declared was a blank space on the map, and it ended with a new name on the map, that of Anzac. So the story of Australia climaxed with a national sacrifice on a beach on the other side of the world. Australia at that time was seen as a new transplanted society with a short and derivative history, a planned, peaceful and successful offshoot of Imperial Britain. Aboriginal peoples depicted as non-literate, non-agricultural, non-urban and non-national could therefore have no history and did not constitute a civilization. Thus, they could find no place in the national polity or the national story, or even as citizens of the Commonwealth. But in the half century since, Australians realised that the new world they thought they discovered was actually the old, and that the true nomads were actually the invaders. They were themselves the colonisers who'd come in ships. From the early 1960s, archaeologists confirmed what Aboriginal people had always known, that Australia's human history went back eons into the Pleistocene, well into the last ice age, earlier than Europe's. The time scale of Australia's human history increased tenfold, tenfold, in just 30 years at the end of the 20th century. And the journey to the other side of the frontier became a journey back into deep time. We now recognise the first Australians as the most adventurous of all humans. They were pioneer sea voyagers who over 60,000 years ago saw the beckoning, burning continent of eucalypts glowing over the horizon of the sea. The island continent girt by sea was transformed into a complex jigsaw of beloved and inhabited Aboriginal countries and ecologies. Aboriginal societies were and are diverse, innovative and adaptive. Over 300 languages flourished here. Now our histories of Australia strive, as the Uluru Statement puts it, strive to let this ancient sovereignty shine through as a fuller expression of Australia's nationhood. This is not going away, no matter how many toddler tantrums the nation has. Reckoning with our deep history is a daily responsibility of living on this continent. Therefore, we can now see more clearly that on Australian beaches in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, there took place one of the greatest ecological and cultural encounters of all time. Peoples with immensely long and intimate histories of habitation encountered the furthest flung representatives of the world's first industrialising nation. The circle of migration out of Africa more than 80,000 years earlier finally closed. This is a land of a radically different ecology, where climatic variation and uncertainty have long been the norm, and now those extremes are intensifying. Australia's long human history spans great climatic change and also offers a parable of cultural resilience. The history of Aboriginal peoples of Australia takes humans back, if not into the ice, then certainly into the ice age into the depths of the last glacial maximum of 20,000 years ago and beyond, into and through periods of average temperature change of five degrees Celsius and more, such as those we might now face. When Europeans and North Americans look for cultural beginnings, they're often prompted to tell you that humans and their civilizations are products of the Holocene, and that we are all children of this recent spring of cultural creativity over the last 10,000 years. By contrast, an Australian history of the world takes us back to humanity's first deep sea navigators and to the experience of people surviving cold ice age droughts 
even in the central Australian deserts. It brings us visions of people living along fast retreating coastlines as they coped with the dramatic rising of the seas. Human civilization here was sustained in the face of massive climate change. This is a story that modern Australians have only just discovered. And now, perhaps it offers a parable for the world. The continent of fire will lead the world into the new age of fire, but it also carries human wisdom and experience from beyond the last ice age. Living on the precipice of deep time, I think has become one of the exhilarating dimensions of what it means to be Australian. We can now see that the modern Australian story in parallel with other colonial cataclysms was a forerunner, a forerunner of the planetary crisis. Indigenous management was overwhelmed, forests cleared, wildlife annihilated, waters polluted and abused, the climate itself unhinged. Across the globe, imperial peoples used land and its creatures as commodities, as if Earth were inert. They forgot that the planet is alive. In the third decade of the 21st century, it's clear that Australia is facing a new existential threat. Quite different to that which Curtin addressed in 1941. We are embroiled in a climate emergency and biodiversity crisis that threaten to destroy our security and way of life. It's not just a threat, it's actually going to happen unless we act swiftly and decisively. It's a planetary event, but Australia and its region are especially vulnerable to its effects. National security assessments and reports from Australian defence chiefs have acknowledged our predicament, identifying the climate crisis as this clear and present danger the greatest threat to the security and future of Australians, and the hundred year war for which we are seriously unprepared. To meet the challenge, we will need to recognise that we do indeed face a crisis, an emergency, and that we will be required to mobilise with a grave sense of urgency, as if in a war. In that December 1941 address to the people, John Curtin sought to wean Australians off a subconscious cultural reflex to trust to luck, isolation and Britain. I demand, he said, I demand that Australians everywhere realise that Australia is now inside the firing lines. He spoke of the need to shake citizens out of false assumptions of security. He talked of awakening the somewhat late, lackadaisical Australian mind and of the reshaping, in fact, revolutionising of the Australian way of life until a war footing is attained quickly, efficiently and without question. We can and we will, he promised. What would a brave but realistic geopolitical pivot look like in our own time? What would constitute a Curtin-esque act of visionary leadership now? I think it would entail a recognition that because of our extreme ecological and economic vulnerability in this escalating crisis, Australia needs to lead the world into the energy transition, not to drag its feet, not to wait for other nations, but actually demonstrate the pathway to zero emissions. Provide global direction and inspiration. And to do so out of intelligent national self-interest, as well as out of world-mindedness. Australia needs to grasp its opportunity as a renewable energy superpower. It needs to wean itself swiftly of its fossil fuel dependency not cling to old, polluting forms of power and vested interests. A Western Australian, like John Curtin, would have to take on that challenge in the mining state, reminding constituents of the long-term significance of minerals 
in the renewable future. Of course it will be difficult and fraught. But that's what leadership is about. Stepping wisely into the future that is coming for you. Yes, it will be difficult. But it is also simple. The physics of the planet are simple. And we know what we have to do and what will happen if we don't. The enemies of action are either ignorant and short-sighted or selfish and greedy. The pathway to electrification has been laid down clearly. The technologies are there or fast developing, as is the business momentum. But the free market can't move fast enough and government must lead. Even funding for the transition is readily available in the form of massive government fossil fuel subsidies that can be diverted and windfall profits to the oil and gas industry that demand to be taxed. The economic, social and environmental benefits to the nation will be immense. I believe that the people are ahead of government on this and that they will welcome bold leadership. To paraphrase John Curtin, we should step into that future now, quite clearly, without any inhibitions of any kind and free of any pangs as to our traditional links or kinship with coal, oil, <laughs> gas, Murdoch and Reinhardt. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Tom, for a fascinating and inspiring lecture. Tonight's talk has covered an enormous amount of ground, branching off from Curtin's leadership to the Australian landscape and the history of settlement to Antarctica and the mysteries of outer space. And I'm sure it will have given everyone something to think about as we leave the lecture theatre tonight. What has impressed me in particular is Tom's ability to see the large picture of earthly events beyond merely human history, to isolate and assess the role of humans in the big historical process, and at the same time, to bring the focus back to the particular and unique role of Australia in the world and in the present. This twofold vision, embodying the pragmatism of the moment in a deep contextual understanding is surely an approach which John Curtin would have approved uh, and which is a model for us all. Uh, before we close tonight's formal proceedings, I'd like to invite the Honourable Kim Beasley AC, patron of the John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library, to deliver the vote of thanks. Well, what a privilege it is and how impossible it is to follow Tom. <laughs> Just brilliant. Um, I once aspired to be a historian. I'm glad I didn't try. <laughs> you, uh, uh, but clearly, uh, you have produced a lecture here, which is um, by far the broadest based, most comprehensive study of what matters in history which is the parts of history that none of us really think about that much. It's the big picture. What is happening to all of us? What's our role in it? What do we need to do? Well, what I need to do first is to acknowledge the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation on whose traditional lands uh, we are meeting. I was so glad that you put our Aboriginal community in perspective because this is one of the most positive things about being Australian, is that we have a people among us uh, still who can look back and do look back in their stories 70,000 years. That is a 
Nobody else, no other Indigenous community actually does that. I think Maoris are about 10. Uh, the Sammies at about 20 or 30. Uh, but uh, American, Native Americans, probably about 10 to 15. So in the, the picture you've presented of the movement through different ages, uh, the Aboriginals go through about two or three. The rest may be one just cheating into two. And I said during the last uh, debate, this terrible, uh, terrible referendum, which has done this country immense damage, um, as uh, a people regarded as properly tending their responsibilities uh, for the nation that they uh, occupy. But the Aboriginal people, in going back 70,000 years, not only predate, um, of course, our period of settlement by a massive margin, they actually predate white people. White people came onto the earth 20 to 30,000 years ago, pigmentation developed in the Northern Hemisphere. White people did not exist before then. So I said in a couple of speeches during the campaign, you know, the one advantage Aboriginal people ha have here, or one of the many advantages they have, uh, is that um, they know who they were 70,000 years ago. They know what their stories were 70,000 years ago. They were beginning to develop their science 70,000 years ago, which enabled them to survive, brilliant in particular in astronomy. And, uh, and a few other things as well, but that astronomy was, their astronomy was uh, truly extraordinary. And um, we basically don't know who we were 70,000 years ago, but we know one thing, all of us, everybody who is white in this, this meeting hall was black. Our ancestors were black people. And um, uh, we are a product, the Aboriginals are a product probably of Africa through uh, India, uh, Southeast Asia to here. We are a product of the Nordics and um, the first changes in pigmentation in the north as people moved into what had been glacial areas. So we've got a, uh, we've got a particular responsibility which uh, we are barely meeting in, um, in understanding the meaning of all of that. And also understanding the incredible age of this nation, this piece of property we inhabit. It is about the oldest place on earth. And I got to learn that once when visiting Pine Gap, the Joint Australian-American Intelligence Facility near Alice Springs. It sits in what is sort of a saucer. So you stand in Pine Gap, you're in a valley of the McDonnell Ranges, which you can see some miles in that direction going up to about 1,000 feet and the other direction going up to about 600 feet. When that land formation occurred, the McDonnell Ranges were the size of the Himalayas. So when you think of the incredible wearing that produced that, it is, it, it's something to conjure with. Then when you go to the fact that we have virtually all the critical minerals, that produces the machinery that's associated with dealing with climate change here. It's a product because the weathering away of volcanoes exposes the centre, and the centre of the volcanoes has rare earth. So if you go to Mikathara and look at the rare earth mine there, that's the very centre of the volcano, which does harbour all the rare earths, which are absolutely essential to the technologies to, uh, to save us. Um, on the rim, of the volcano, which is sort of circular about 50 to 70 miles from that, that central point, there's five gold mines. So the gold goes to the outer end and the rare earth goes to, uh, the rare earth goes to the middle. And we have a particular responsibility to ensure that these are developed effectively. And as luck would have it for the rest of the globe, we actually know how to mine. And we are the best miners on earth. And uh, we have a chance to make a contribution. A contribution will never be made by the private sector. 
it is not possible for them to do it. Actually has to be done, maybe in conjunction with the private sector, it has to be done by government. It has to be done by a government that accepts responsibility for the earth, the, the state of the earth. It's interesting how, how experimental we are in oddball areas. The biggest plant, geothermal plant, in the Southern Hemisphere is being built at the Australian War Memorial. And when it is opened, it will give the War Memorial 90% of the power that it has. If you go out to HMAS Stirling, which is soon going to be the base of nuclear submarines, it is, it is powered in large amount, not exclusively, in large amount, uh, by tidal and wave power. And uh, the systems are in place, and that is already occurring in it. And um, we have to pick up all of those aspects of, uh, of renewables uh, if we're going to survive what there is in front of us. We are, uh, that's, that's long term. We face immediate catastrophe uh, in the region around us. Um, we, and I'm sure, as a historian, you've, you've probably got a pretty solid fix on uh, where we're headed. But my immediate security fear is not actually an invasion of Taiwan. I think the Chinese won't. Uh, but my immediate fear is the Mekong River. Uh, the Mekong River has, uh, uh, is a huge focal point of agriculture and life for well over 200 million people in Southeast Asia. It is rapidly going sailing. The uh, salt is coming up the mouth of the river. The Chinese have already built north of the river 11 um, dams already, and they've got plans for another 12 and they're proceeding with it. There'll be 23 dams on the Mekong, forget it. It's over. And probably in the next 20 to 25 years. What will we then be saying to the 250 million people who can no longer really inhabit it or live off it? That's gonna be interesting. Particularly because there's one area we haven't properly measured in relation to climate change, but we have some indications. And that is, the north of Australia is going to be turned into a market garden. Not a granary, a market garden. So heavy will the rainfall be on the, uh, on the north of the country. Uh, there will also be temperature problems associated with that as well. But that's, uh, we need your speech all over the place because it will seed an awful lot of thought in a multiplicity of different directions. Back to the, the uh, Aboriginal people of this, uh, of this country, it will, to a considerable degree, restore their size. Um, they do know how to handle fire. And um, that's uh, a skill which none of the rest of us really have. But their learning will be immensely important uh, in, in regard to our handling that. And, uh, and, and you've just put the best possible case for, uh, for us to take uh, a serious note of, uh, of what their skills are and what we ought to do about it. We're sort of, there's not many of them left. There were, uh, that map you put up, I think there's about 250, 300 nations, Aboriginal nations. Um, there's not that now, not by a long chalk. But the greatest point of their survival is WA. Um, native title doesn't really exist anywhere else in Australia. West Australia is now 80% covered by some form of native title. Uh, part of that is two treaties that the government signed, one with uh, the Noongar people, the other with the Southern Yamaji. But that's not the major part of native title. The major part of native title is the north and centre. And that's over 50% of the area covered by native title here. Add them together, and we cover 90% by area 
of native title in Australia. It just doesn't really exist anywhere else. Not in the Northern Territory, but for weird reasons. Um, the, if you look at the content of the High Court decision, it made a uh, determination that um, other forms of title suppress native title. Native title was British common law. That's basically what it was. But any uh, formal process of assigning another type of title actually suppressed native title, so we stopped worrying about our backyards. But the oddball thing in the Northern Territory is they passed land rights. And they set up a series of land councils down the Northern Territory, and the legislation suppressed all native title. We didn't know it did uh, when they put it forward, but that's what it actually has done. So they're trying now to sort of unpick it a bit so they can work out who owns what, because there's no relationship really between the land decisions and actual native title. Uh, in fact, it, it's very hard to cope with native title in some ways. Uh, when I was governor and I'd go north and there'd been virtually all of it had by then been settled in native title terms, I'd be taken aside invariably by an Aboriginal bloke who'd say, Got to intervene. The decision that was taken is not right. It's a sign this family, these areas of responsibility. That's not right. It's ours. And I say, mate, it's your land. You go and talk to them. There's nothing anymore we can do about it. We turned it loose, and you're there now, and uh, you have to work your way through that uh, with them. We can't help. But um, they'll be all right. You know, that, that, that'll all sort itself out. But the, but the thing is that um, we should take pride in the fact that we finally owned up, but also acknowledge the fact that the vast bulk of the Aboriginal people get nothing from it. And perhaps what we've done with the Yamaji and with the Noongas actually shows up what sort of treaties you can have in the Eastern States. To, uh, to restore some form of justice. I mean, every, every now and then I get to really like a Liberal. And um, I do like Colin Barnett, because I'd kiss him for this. He started the, uh, just the same way as uh, Turnbull government started The Voice. Um, he sat down to negotiate with the Noongar. The Noongar negotiators sat opposite him. And they said to him, we regard ourselves as negotiating nation to nation. He replied, so do we. That's a, uh, that is an extraordinary recognition. And, uh, and it succeeded in the end, but in that it was a monetary thing, two or three billion dollars. But um, they, and that's not small money. And, uh, and that is for them to work through uh, how that ought to be utilised. But um, that's a bit off the point. The main point is what you were, uh, you were talking about. But I think on behalf of everyone else here, we have had an intellectual bath. Absolutely. We've been sitting there while the facts have been showering us. And um, we have uh, learned so much. It's an extraordinary thing, and John Curtin was all about resilience, but a resilience in a totally different context. We need resilience that starts with comprehension. And uh, the, the way you put it really does give us that. It's, uh, it, it, it's multidisciplinary history that, uh, that you presented, and um, perhaps there's some lessons there to the way history should now be taught uh, in our universities and in our schools, um, because you actually learn something from it. You actually learn something that's useful, and you also get marching orders. That's just been brilliant. Thanks, Tom. Thank Thank you, Mr. Beasley, for your insights and your kind words. And thank you, too, for making the special trip to be with us this evening. 
This brings us to the end of the formalities for tonight. Um, before we step outside to enjoy some light refreshments and what I'm sure will be great conversations about what we have just heard, um, I'd like to call Tom back to the stage to accept a small token of our appreciation for presenting tonight's lecture and extend our heartfelt thanks to, to you and, and your wife for joining us. In concluding, uh, I would just like to thank University Events and JCPML and library staff for their work in making tonight's event possible. Thank you again to everyone for joining us at this year's John Curtin Prime Ministerial Library Anniversary Lecture, and we hope to see you again next year. Wishing you all a great evening.